Good morning. Thank you, everybody, for being here, and welcome to the 10th annual IMFAR press conference. I'm Dana Marnane. I'm the Vice President for Awareness and Events at Autism Speaks and the co-chair for IMFAR's Public Relations Committee. I want to quickly run through today's format for the event, but first I'd like to introduce two people here who've also been uh, critical in getting the press conference together. The first is my co-chair, Allison Singer, who is also the president of the Autism Science Foundation, and Jane Rubenstein, who, Rubenstein with Rubenstein Communications. Jane is uh, handling most of the PR for this event. We're going to hear first from Dr. David Amaral of the Mind Institute. Um, Dr. Amaral is also the president of INSAR. INSAR, the International Society for Autism Research, is the host of IMFAR. He'll speak about the overall themes likely to emerge from IMFAR this year. Then I will introduce our panelists whose research is being highlighted here at the press conference. Each investigator will speak briefly and show a, a slide presentation. I ask you to hold all of your questions until all of our panelists have, sp have completed their talks. Those of you participating by conference call can email your questions into Jane. And Jane's email is jrubenstein at rubenstein. And that, please note the difference in spellings. It's J-R-U-B-I-N-S-T-E-I-N -E at rubenstein, R-U-B-E-N-S-T-E-I-N. Um, and at the conclusion of today's proceedings, all of our speakers will be available for one-on-one -on -one interviews, or you can reach out to Allison, Jane, or I, and we'll set them up for you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Amaral. Thanks, Dana. And uh, welcome to everybody uh, to uh, IMPAR 2011, which is our 10th anniversary uh, meeting. Uh, the IMPAR meeting uh, was first held here in San Diego in 2001. Uh, and we thought it was a huge success when we had 250 uh, attendees. Oh, I think we were supposed to say that. Please turn off cell phone. No. <laughs> uh, I guess you guys need to have your cell phones, so that's okay. Uh, the field has grown enormously since 2001, and this year we're expecting to have something on the order of 2,000 attendees. So autism, as you know, is an incredibly complex disorder that now affects nearly 1% of children. The range of severity is huge, from children who have no language and are seriously developmentally delayed to others who have normal or superior intelligence uh, but still have disability and social interactions. And the list of comorbid disorders, including epilepsy, anxiety, and gastrointestinal problems, is long and debilitating. There is still little certainty of what causes autism. Yet there's a tremendous effort being undertaken to understand the causes of autism and to develop more effective treatments to lessen disability. INSAR, the International Society for Autism Research, which is the parent society that manages IMFAR, is aware of the public's interest in everything autism and decided two years ago to establish a public relations committee to communicate the research presented at this meeting uh, to the general public. Uh, Co-chairs Allison Singer and Dana Marnane uh, with the assistant of, assistance of Jane Rubenstein, have organized this press conference and will be the continuing conduit uh, for communication between IMFAR and the press. So the science that will be highlighted here in the press conference is just a sampling of the diverse research that's going to be presented at IMFAR. Uh, IMFAR is a complicated disorder and uh, it's being attacked from various vantage points. So that, there'll be genetic studies presented at IMFAR, There'll be uh, neuroscience or brain research studies, uh, ranging from connectivity studies, imaging studies, uh, to chemical pathways. Uh, and there'll be, um, as you'll hear today, uh, a variety of studies that look at environmental influences on the cause of autism. Clinical research deals with topics ranging from early detection of autism to the impact of having a child with autism on family life. I want to say that much of the science that's presented at uh, IMFAR is based on initial studies, and at least some of it has not yet gone through peer review. But we hope that this press conference and the meeting in general will convey some of the excitement in the field and the passion with which scientists and clinicians pursue the difficult questions concerning autism. 
So we uh, welcome you to this press conference and to what we hope will be a very exciting and informative uh, meeting this year. So thanks very much. Dana? Thank you, David. Um, here on our panel today are four distinguished researchers. Two of the people we had intended to have participate unfortunately had last minute uh, issues and were not able to attend the press conference, but they will be available to the media for one-on-one -on -one interviews later during the conference. First up is Dr. Eric Corshane um, from right here at UC San Diego, whose study is titled Abnormally Accelerated Development of Higher Order Long Distance Cerebral Tracts in ASD Infants and Toddlers. And I'd like to now bring up Dr. Corshane. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much uh, for the wonderful introduction, uh, David, to the conference, and Dana to the press conference. And um, our research uh, has uh, focused on the question of what are the connections that underlie the beginnings of autism. Autism begins in the first years of life, but the neural underpinnings for autism remain largely a mystery. We do know that early on, the first warning signs involve social, language, and communication functions. Those functions are handled primarily by long distance, complex networks involving frontal cortex and temporal cortex. Those long distance fibers convey, are very slow to mature ordinarily, and they are the ones that ordinarily convey important information that enables the development and maturation of the highest human functions, uh, social understanding and language and communication. Surprisingly enough, there are no studies that have looked at the connections or the fiber tracks and bundles that are involved in these uh, processes. These are large bundles that extend from one portion of the brain to another. In the study that we report, we examined 84 infants and toddlers, ages 12 months to about 40 months of age, who have ASD, confirmed ASD. We identified them through a novel method called the one-year well baby checkup that was recently published in the Journal of Pediatrics and received quite intense uh, interest by the press because it's a method of identifying kids at risk for autism at a very early age so that they can be, they can be helped but they can also be studied and we did brain imaging with them. We followed them longitudinally and confirmed their diagnoses. We also studied typically developing kids, 54. The grand total of 84 plus 54 makes us the largest diffusion tensor imaging connectivity study done in autism. And of course, it's unique because we're looking at autism as it begins. We also utilize the resources of UCSD's uh, MMIL. MMIL is headed by Dr. Anders Dale. Dr. Dale is a world-renowned uh, neuroimaging expert and has developed uh, perhaps one of the foremost uh, methodologies involving uh, mapping tracks within the brain. And at this point, I'd like to give uh, special thanks to uh, Stephanie Solso, who's the first author, and she's in the second row on the right-hand side. And then, of course, to Anders Dale, uh, Karen Pierce, uh, Don Hagler, and others. <clears throat> so with this, what we discovered were remarkable and striking differences in age-related changes in measurements of these tracks. And the tracks that we identified as being particularly involved were these sets of tracks here and not these tracks here. So we found tracks that are and tracks that are not abnormal in the way they change with age. We found accelerated maturation of all these frontal and temporal tracks, tracks that interconnect uh, within a single cor frontal cortex, U fibers that enable complex functions within frontal cortex to take place. We also found tracks that uh, interact between subcortical regions and frontal cortex, the striatal tract. We also found the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which includes the arcuate fasciculus. This is a well-known, long-established tract that's crucial for language and communication functions and interconnects regions of the temporal lobe with regions of the frontal lobe. And it's through those interconnections and the establishment of the function of that tract that language matures. On the left side, the ability to decode semantic meaning, and on the right side, the ability to decode semantic 
uh, language, pragmatics. In addition, the unsinate fasciculus. The unsinate fasciculus is key because it interconnects frontal cortex with the limbic system. The limbic system is key in a variety of motion processing, and Dr. Amaral is one of the world's experts in uh, aspects of the limbic system, including the amygdala, and his group have reported amygdala anatomic abnormalities, and here we find connections between uh, temporal lobe, including the amygdala, and frontal cortex abnormal at the very first uh, in life. And then finally, this tract here, which interconnects the right and left sides of the frontal cortex, so that the two hemispheres are able to share their knowledge, information, and develop special capabilities for differentiating um, between the meaning, higher order meaning, as well as social meaning. <clears throat> and now let me show you what the data look like. I'm going to show you three examples. The superior frontal fasciculus. This is the fiber tract that interconnects temporal to frontal. This is age, from uh, 12 months of age out to 48 months of age. And this is the measure of the uh, maturation of that tract. It's called FA, or fractional anisotropy. And what we found is that early on, in one-year-olds to two-year-olds with autism, shown in the red lines here, there's, is that visible with the light shining on it? OK, because from here I can't see the dots are very much. But what it shows is that there's a greater FA value early between 12 months and 24 months, which indicates a premature accelerated development of this fiber track as compared to controls, normal typically developing. But you can see that with time, by the time children are three to four years old, that there's a lower FA, suggesting a slowed, continued growth of FA. That's also true of the unsinate fasciculus, which is the fiber track between uh, uh, temporal cortex, including the amygdala and frontal cortex, and the forceps minor, which is the pathway that interconnects right and left uh, uh, frontal uh, cortices. So you can see in each one of these cases, there's a general phenomenon, which is accelerated, premature, over uh, uh, development of these major connections in these regions that underlie the key symptoms of autism and then slowed or arrested growth. And we know from studies in the literature, because there's a large number of studies of the older autistic brain, that this is the correct outcome because all studies of, of these measures in older autistic individuals show reductions. So we, we've discovered is not the outcome but the beginning. And the beginning point it appears is, an over, is probably an overabundance of connections in these main fiber tracts. The overabundance of connections in these fiber tracts might reflect not only excess numbers of fibers, but the failure of these fibers to strongly differentiate uh, themselves. We suspect that early on what happens is this excess connectivity is dysfunctional. And the dysfunctional connectivity precludes the further growth and maturation of these tracks. So early on, too much connectivity leads to interference of those functions. And the interference of those functions precludes the further development and specialization of those tracks as well as the cortex. And that leads to further decline in autistic function. Now an implication of this is that if connectivity is aberrant very early in life, it means the sooner that early, inter, uh, the sooner a child is identified as being at risk for autism and gotten into treatment, the more possible it might be that experience and learning may guide the further growth of these axons, causing them to make more suitable connections and mature more successfully. So early on, we suspect that biologically driven abnormalities that regulate the growth of these major systems of pathways is the first step down the path of the failure of autistic, uh, the failure of these higher order functions that marks autism the first year of life. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Korshain. Next on our panel today, we're going to hear from Dr. Antonio Hardin, who's with Stanford University, and he'll be sharing his study, a randomized controlled double-blind trial of N-acystine in children with autism. Dr. Hardin. Very good. 
Good morning. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me uh, this morning to talk about the work that we've been doing. Uh, my name is Antonio Hardin. I'm at uh, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford University. Uh, I'll be talking today a few minutes about uh, the work that we've been doing examining the uh, N-acetylcysteine. So the background about uh, N-acetylcysteine is that this is a, a medication or a compound that's available over the counter. And if you talk to families, parents of children with autism, a good percentage of them have used N-acetylcysteine in different shapes or form, either IV or PO. And uh, based on the interest that the families had in this compound, we looked into it and tried to see if there is any scientific evidence that would justify the use of this compound in children with autism. As a background with regard to the state of treatment, the medication treatment in autism at this time is unfortunately there is no effective agent that's available that will target the core features of autism. The core features, I mean, you know, the social deficits, the communication deficits, and the language deficit that we see in kids with autism. The agents that are available currently addresses, or they address the uh, associated behavior, uh, disruptive behavior, irritability, aggression, um, agitation, hyperactivity. The problem of the, the agents that are available is that they have uh, a lot of side effects. Increased weight, uh, increased sedation, uh, risk for involuntary motor movement. That's why we continue to look for agents or compound that will target the core features, but also uh, that will target the associated behaviors with a minimal price with, or with minimal side effects. So NAC, interestingly, when we started looking at its uh, uh, biochemical profile, we found that it's a glutamatergic modulator, which means it modulates the glutamatergic system. And the glutamatergic system has been implicated in autism. There have been several papers, several studies looking at, in terms of the neuropathology, um, neurochemical, and genetic study linking the glutamatergic system to autism. And NAC modulate the system. Uh, and this is based on several studies and several studies not only in autism, but in other uh, disorders such as obsessive compulsive disorder and trichotillomania. The second aspect uh, of NAC is that it's an antioxidant. And in the system, in, the, in every neuron, in every cell, you have a system that is um, responsible to eliminate the bad products or the free radicals. And apparently, uh, and acetylcysteine is a precursor to glutathione that will allow the degradation of bad compounds. So we decided to get this compound, and we didn't get it from a regular pharmacy over the counter. We got it from a, a company that's known to uh, provide NAC in a very specific way, because the one that you will get over the counter, it gets oxidized, and it's not very effective. So we got that. And uh, it took us probably about a year and a half to get the compound uh, approved by the FDA and uh, available to us. And we did a gold standard study. It's a randomized controlled uh, study, a 12-week trial. And we looked at uh, a total of 33 kids. And uh, about four of them, they were, were not able to take the compounds uh, immediately after randomization. So what we did here, I, we did analysis, preliminary analysis with 21, 29 subjects. And tomorrow afternoon, I will, will provide you, I'll be presenting this information, and uh, there will be much more information that I will be talking about today. So basically, we wanted to look at mainly the associated behaviors, disruptive behaviors, and irritability. And we use a measure called the aberrant behavior checklist, which is a, a standard measure that we use in these kind of studies. And what we found, is that NAC and acetylcysteine was able to decrease the level of disruptive behaviors and decrease the level of irritability in kids with autism. And this is compared to individuals who received the placebo. So we had about 14 kids who received the active NAC and 15 who received the active placebo. And we, when we compared the two groups, we found clearly significant differences between the two groups supporting the effectiveness of N acetylcysteine in targeting irritability and uh, disruptive behaviors. But that's what, like, our main goal. The second goal that we were looking at is trying to see if it will help the core features, social deficits, repetitive behaviors, or language. 
when we looked at social, we looked at language, we didn't find any significant uh, benefit to uh, an acetylcysteine. But when we looked at repetitive behaviors, we did, we did see some clear benefits. However, these benefits did not survive when we control when we controlled for uh, changes in irritability and total disruptive behaviors. And that's important because uh, this is a small study and a future large multi-center study will definitely is needed to be able to sort out these issues. In terms of tolerability, we had uh, very limited side effects. We had few kids who complained of gastrointestinal side effects such as nausea, uh, uh, diarrhea, and um, one or two kids actually experienced some uh, vomiting. But overall, it, it was very well uh, tolerated. So that's a little bit about the, the study. And as I mentioned, tomorrow we'll be talking a little bit more details about uh, the study tomorrow afternoon. But in summary, this is a very preliminary trial. I want to advise people to, start, to go tomorrow and start using NAC blindly on all the kids, on all individuals with autism. We have to wait for large studies before we'll be able to confirm the validity or the, this, these findings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hardin. Okay, next, our third panelist is Irva Hertz Pichotto. Um, Irva is another California based researcher from UC Davis, and Irva is actually presenting on three studies today, briefly touching on all three. Um, they're somewhat interrelated the role of maternal diabetes and related conditions in autism and other developmental delay, prenatal influenza or fever and risk of autism or autism spectrum disorders and cesarean birth and autism spectrum disorder. Dr. hertz -Pizioto. Thank you very much. So uh, it's uh, with great pleasure that I'm uh, presenting these three papers. Uh, all of them are based on the CHARGE study, which stands for Childhood Autism Risks from Genetics in the Environment. Uh, and <clears throat> the, I've listed here the three primary authors on uh, these three papers. Uh, all of us are from the MIND Institute at the University of California at Davis. Uh, the CHARGE study is significant because it is the first comprehensive study looking at environmental factors in autism. Uh, by comprehensive, I mean that we didn't go in with a priori uh, beliefs about uh, what were the causes of autism, but are casting a rather wide net uh, looking at maternal factors, environmental factors of a, of a wide range of uh, types. We also have in this study clinical confirmation of all of the diagnoses and also confirmation that our control groups don't have uh, the diagnoses of interest here, which include both autism, uh, autism spectrum disorders, as well as other forms of developmental delay. Um, and the control groups are, in fact, the whole study is population-based, so unlike many studies that are out there, uh, we have uh, not a convenience sample, but samples that have been uh, scientifically sa uh, sampled from the population. In this case, controls come from the birth files uh, representing the general population. And uh, in addition to that, we have a large sample size. So these are some of the unique features at this stage uh, in terms of looking at epidemiologic approaches to understanding autism's causes. Uh, the focus here is on identifying those factors that are modifiable. We'd like to be able to intervene and actually prevent cases of autism in the future. So each of these factors may have routes through which we could po potentially intervene uh, and reduce risk. So the first paper I'll talk about is uh, uh, work of a graduate student. Uh, his name is Useni Zerbo, and he's been looking at prenatal influenza or fever and the risk of autism. Now, previous studies have found that maternal viral infections during pregnancy have been associated with autism. Some of these are very old studies and looked at infections that today we're not worried about because we have effective vaccination programs that prevent uh, things like congenital rubella, which is uh, also known as uh, German measles, um, and mumps. Uh, and the, uh, another piece of evidence in terms of previous work is actually a paper that uh, uh, Useni pa published last week in the journal Epidemiology looking at season of conception. 
uh, and looking at when the child was conceived in terms of the calendar year, discovering that the conceptions that occurred in the winter months uh, are at somewhat higher risk for autism. Now, it's not a huge uh, increase in risk, but it does suggest, it does give us some evidence that we ought to be looking at least for some of the causes that may have seasonal patterns. They may vary over time, and it doesn't have to be that it's occurring at the time of conception. It could be that it's happening sometime later, months two, three, or four, for example, uh, during the gestational period, but that there is some time period that might be a vulnerable period, and that risk can be increased through some sort of a trigger that occurs during the in utero period. Uh, so in this particular study now, looking um, at the charge study, we uh, had maternal reports uh, of whether she, during the pregnancy, and of course she's recalling back in time, so these are retrospective reports, about fever during pregnancy or uh, a case of influenza, whether she had an influenza infection. And what we found was that those mothers who reported fever um, were twofold higher, uh, had the, the, the risk was twofold higher that their child would develop an autism spectrum disorder. We also found that the risk was strongest if that fever occurred in the first or the second trimester of pregnancy. We did not see an association with maternally reported influenza. And in this case, the fever included mothers who had influenza with fever. Um, as well as other causes of fever. So these results, in fact, gr add to a growing body of evidence that maternally mediated inflammation might be part of the mechanistic pathway leading to autism. And some of the other sources of evidence of this type of a hypothesis come from animal studies, which uh, have shown that injection of fragments of a viral, uh, fragments of the virus injected into a rodent will produce aberrant behaviors in the rat pups, uh, suggesting that there, again, that, that uh, something going on. And because it, it occurs even without the actual viral infection in, that, in those rodent studies, it suggests that it's the maternal response to the infection rather than the infection itself, rather than the microbe. Um, other results that, that go along with this, this body of evidence that's pointing towards inflammatory processes uh, comes from the uh, uh, autopsy studies, which have shown biochemically that there's some evidence of neuroinflammation in the brains of, of uh, persons with autism. Um, so this is a, a, a growing body of evidence uh, that that may be part of the process and an acute fever uh, during pregnancy might be part of that uh, story. So turning then to the second paper, this is on maternal diabetes and related conditions in, in relation to autism and other developmental delays. And this is work by Paula Krakowiak, another graduate student of mine. She looked at three chronic conditions during pregnancy, diabetes, either type 2, in other words, an underlying pre-existing diabetes, or gestational diabetes, uh, chronic hypertension, and pre-pregnancy obesity, which is defined using body mass index. It's a ratio of the weight to the height. We found that for mothers with at least one of these conditions, there was a 60% increased risk for autism in the offspring. And for developmental delay, it was actually about 150% increased risk. So this isn't specific necessarily to autism. It may be a more general phenomenon that affects neurodevelopment, uh, including uh, autism. And another part of this research showed that diabetes itself was associated with poor expressive language. And this was both in children with autism um, as well as children without autism. So poor language development in terms of expressive language as opposed to receptive language um, for these children, um, whether they had autism or not. So a few points difference on, on a scale here. This again is further evidence that there is potentially uh, metabolic disruption and some sort of inflammatory pathway. In this case, these are chronic conditions which would be going on um, once it sort of develops, it could continue throughout uh, the rest of the pregnancy. And then now turning to the birth, going a little forward in time, uh, 
we did an investigation looking at mode of delivery, and the primary author on this is Dr. Walker, uh, who is an OBGYN. And uh, we looked at non-elective C-section deliveries. We also looked at elective C-sections and vaginal deliveries. And we compared the elective C-sections as well as the non-elective C-sections with the vaginal births. Uh, we found that the risk for autism or ASD was elevated in the non-elective uh, cesarean deliveries, but after we adjusted for underlying indications, uh, this was actually no longer the case. So what this seems to point to is that some of those underlying indications for that might precipitate uh, a cesarean birth, uh, such as preeclampsia, diabetes, intraamniotic infection, placental insufficiency, and breach presentation may be what's really going on and that it's not the surgery itself, but something that is preexisting uh, in the pregnancy or in the child's uh, 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 development. So those are the three papers that I have to, uh, that we will be presenting over the next few days. Um, these are, in fact, preliminary results, as Dr. Amaral pointed out. Uh, they have yet to undergo peer review, and that's why we're here to discuss them with our colleagues. But we think that they uh, provide some indication of the directions of, of research in this area, and uh, will be stimulating, hopefully, further research on these same topics. Thank you very much, Dr. Picciotto. Um, next is Dr. David Mendel with the University of Pennsylvania. He's going to be sharing two studies with us today, the effect of childhood autism on parental employment and general education teachers' perceptions of inclusion for children with autism. One of the great joys of my work is to um, work with really brilliant, enterprising uh, graduate students and then take credit for their work. And I'm going to do that twice today. Um, the first uh, study on uh, parental labor market participation and outcomes and costs um, was uh, conducted by Zuleha Sadav, a, a postdoc of mine who will be presenting this uh, during this conference. So there's been a lot of concern about the costs of uh, raising a child with autism. And most of the attention on those costs has focused on what we might think of as direct costs. That is, uh, money that's spent directly for their care, either in the education system or especially in the healthcare system. And there's been a, a lot of concerns that those costs are very high. Um, many of you may know that 24 states in the United States have passed in autism insurance mandates between 2008 and 2011 that require private insurance companies to cover treatment for children with autism. And those insurance companies have come back and said that this is an undue burden and will result in raised premiums and ultimately greater societal costs. Um, and most of the argument has focused on those costs. And we believe that there's another half of that story that hasn't really been addressed. And that is what we might think of as indirect costs. That is, what are the costs to families, um, both in terms of out-of-pocket payments, but also in terms of um, things about their lives that they have to change? That, uh, that might balance out uh, those treatment costs, especially if treatment is effective. And so uh, Dr. Sadav used a data set called the Medical Expenditures Panel Survey, which is probably the most uh, comprehensive uh, regular survey that's done in the United States that asks uh, parents about their children's uh, health and health care. And it also asks a lot of other questions, including um, uh, parents' employment. And so the first thing we wanted to look at was whether there was a difference in labor market participation, that is whether parents were working, uh, comparing families of children with autism to families of children with some other kind of health limitation, and we, we categorize that very broadly. There's specifically a question uh, in the survey that asks about limitations, and then um, other children where uh, there's no health limitation. And as you can see from the slide, there's, in terms of having at least one parent employed, there's no difference among these three groups, and there's no difference among fathers uh, in employment. Where there is a difference is among mothers. And you see that uh, mothers of children 
with autism, about uh, 60, 62% of them were employed compared to 76% of mothers and family, uh, of children with no health limitations. So it does seem that there's some uh, suppression of labor market participation associated with having a child diagnosed with autism and children, mothers of children with other health care limitations, other health limitations were somewhere in the middle. But the, the, the bigger issue is the extent to which this affects family income. And it turns out, it turns out I can't turn my slide. Um, um, sorry, these are just the, uh, um, this is still the same slide. I will tell you the punchline before you see the slide. So, oh, look at that. No, I won't. All right. And it turns out that it's associated with a large uh, reduction in family income. Uh, uh, we might think of it as a 27% reduction in family income, or $17,640 for mothers of children or families of children with autism compared to families of children with no health care limitations. And there's a substantial decrease in family income compared with uh, families of children with other health care, other health limitations as well. And in these slides, in these analyses, we adjusted for parental education, for parental age, for what region of the country they lived in, for ethnicity, um, pretty much anything that you can think of that have been, has been found in previous studies to be associated with both labor market participation and, uh, and family income. So a big question is why? Um, the most immediate cause that people might jump to is that uh, there's something about raising a child with autism that is more challenging or more disruptive than raising a child with other health care limitations. Um, and we, in further analysis, hope to look at specific types of health care limitations because in that category is a broad array of children, ranging from children with attention deficit disorder who are otherwise well-functioning to children with spina bifida and cerebral palsy. So we need to separate those things out, but I don't think it's the sort of burden associated with the condition per se. I think what it is is that um, families of children with autism don't have a care system the way that other families do. So if you have a child with intellectual disability or with spina bifida, it can be extraordinarily challenging, but your pathway through the healthcare system is more clear. And many families of children with autism are cobbling together services from multiple systems and fighting with their schools and fighting with their healthcare uh, systems and their insurers in a way that other families are not. And while this study does not show that, numerous studies before this have. And so I think what happens is that the mother drops out of the labor market to become the case manager for the child. And so when we think about what the effect, you know, what's causing that, it's not necessarily that you have a child with autism. That's a necessary but not sufficient step for this, uh, for this reduction in income. It's actually, I think, related to the care system for that child and that so when we think about those other costs, like those costs associated with having insurance cover um, uh, services for children with autism, we need to think about them in that context and what they do to larger societal costs and to family costs as a whole. Um, and so I can go to the... So the next study was conducted by, um, by Perry Rosen and Aaron Rotham Fuller, uh, both now at Temple University, and Perry is sitting in the back. Perry, raise your hand. So if people have questions about this study, she's really the person you want to talk with. A huge uh, um, controversy in the education system is the extent to which children with autism should be included with their typically developing peers in general education settings. On the one hand, these children often have very specialized needs that perhaps are best met in more segregated settings. But on the other hand, the, the fundamental difference among people with autism compared with other people is, relates to socialization and social skills. And we know that the way that children learn uh, social skills is by interacting with their peers. And so when you segregate these children, they don't have opportunities for that interaction. Often, also, the cognitive profile of these children is very uneven. So you may have children who have really strong abilities in certain areas and, and less than average abilities in others. And if they're in that segregated setting, those 
those strong pockets of ability they have may languish um, in the service of, of addressing things that people think of as specific to the autism. And Perry became very interested in the extent to which general education teachers felt prepared to have children with autism in their classrooms. And so she's conducted a small pilot study, which will soon be a larger pilot study, and then a full-blown study looking at uh, uh, surveying teachers in general education settings who have children with autism in their classrooms, um, and whether they felt that that was appropriate and what other supports need to be in place. And so these are, this is by student. If you look at the students of the teachers who were surveyed, you'll see that most of them were included for the full day in general education settings. That's what the GE stands for, as opposed to general electric. And then a smaller number were included in, uh, in, in other settings, um, you know, about, with about 18% uh, in mostly spending most of their day in general education settings, a smaller percentage spending 50%. Um, and then even smaller percentage spending most of their day in an autism support classroom, and then by definition, none of them were full day in an autism support classroom. So the blue bar recommends their current placement, and the red bar recommends what the teacher, uh, the red bar represents what the teacher thought their placement should be. And you'll notice that generally teachers um, were okay with the placement. The more time they spent in general, the kids spent in general education, the less likely the teacher was to think that placement was appropriate, but those aren't huge differences. Um, and then for kids who are half day in general education, many of the teachers felt that, uh, that the children uh, could spend more time in that general education setting. So this is very encouraging and suggests that at least when we, we think about beliefs and attitudes, that teachers in general education settings feel that, that it's appropriate for these children to be included. Um, there may be some issues of social desirability and how teachers respond to the survey. I think we need to think also about how to look at their actions as well as what they present as their beliefs. When you look at what, parent, what, what teachers say when they're asked, well, what additional supports do you need in order for, to have more children with autism in your classroom or to fully support the children with autism in the classroom? In this uh, graph, the way to read this graph is higher numbers mean all the supports are in place that I need, and lower, number me, lower numbers mean we need more support. So when it comes to the classroom, teachers felt, now there could be some more resources, and a lot of them talked about needing more one-to-one -one aids or more assistance in the classroom, when the issue was whether they as a teacher felt prepared uh, to accept children with autism in their classroom, they felt that they were pretty prepared. They felt that uh, they, this was not an area where they felt as much support or education or training was needed. Um, but they also felt so the, that the children were coming to their classrooms unprepared uh, to be in a general education classroom. So this is kind of strange. It's the teacher saying, yes, I'm prepared to have this child with autism in my general education classroom, but that child with autism is not prepared. Um, and so uh, what Perry and I think might be happening is teachers are putting the burden for inclusion on the child rather than thinking about the adaptations that might be necessary in the classroom setting for that child to be fully included. And I think that what that means is when we think about interventions for increasing inclusion for children uh, with autism in general education settings, it means we're probably going to have to do some values clarifications with teachers about where the onus should be for um, making that context a good fit for that child. Um, that it's not so much about the child receiving additional training or support elsewhere and then being dropped into the classroom ready to learn. It's really about the teacher working with that child in that setting to help that child be ready to learn. Uh, and so I'll stop there and I think we're done, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, now I'd like to, uh, before we go to the question and answer period, I'd like to introduce another researcher that's here with us today um, whose research was also highlighted by the um, INSAR organizers as being press worthy. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Kelly, if you could please stand. Um, she is going to be presenting a study this week, uh, Predictors of Peer Victimization in Adolescents with and Without an Autism Spectrum Disorder, and she is available for one-on-one -on -one interviews after the press conference or throughout the press conference. Um, Dr. Sigan Hartley, did he, oh, 
she, sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Dr. Hartley from the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, was also uh, highlighted by the um, INSAR committee. Um, and her study is called Psychological Well-Being in Fathers of Adolescents and Young Adults with Autism Spectrum Disorders, Down Syndrome, and Fragile X. Um, she's also available to discuss her study after the press conference or during the week. Um, now I'd like to start taking questions from the audience and also from the people on the phone. If you'd raise your hand when I call on you, um, please state your name and media outlet as well as to whom your question is being directed to. We, as I said earlier, have members of the media who are on the phone. Um, and just as a reminder to them, please email your questions to Jane Rubenstein at Rubenstein, and that's J-R-U-B-I-N-S-T-E-I-N at Rubenstein, R-U-B-E-N-S-T-E-I-N dot com. And um, we'll get started right now. Um, if you can, we have a microphone here, if that's easier, then the people on the phone can hear you clearly. Uh, Kathleen Doney, covering for WebMD. We're a consumer site, if you're not familiar with this. One question for Dr. Pardon my pitchy Odo. Um, can you elaborate on what the mechanism might be, on this, particularly the diabetes, which my editor is interested in, and the development of autism? And second part of the question, what might mothers do? Example, would tight control the diabetes make a difference? I have one other question. We need disclosures from everyone. I don't know if you have them written. Any disclosures? I'm sure we can get those to you after the conference. Yes, so in regard to the diabetes, uh, diabetes is complex. There are inflammatory uh, pathways that uh, can lead to diabetes. There is the, uh, a lot going on in which hyperinsulinemia uh, affects uh, endothelial function and uh, a, a host, there's a whole cascade of uh, responses that happened metabolically and, and physiologically that uh, you know, could influence neurodevelopment in the child. Diabetes actually has uh, a number of effects. It, it, it results in, because of the, the glucose imbalance, results in uh, the fetus uh, actually growing to be too large. So you get um, uh, macrosomic babies uh, from uh, diabetic mothers. That's, that's been known for quite a long time. Um, and there is some literature about neurodevelopmental long-term consequences, but surprisingly little literature on that. And of course, now that we are seeing this growth in obesity and diabetes um, nationally and elsewhere in the world as well, um, the public health importance, I think, is, is, is really something that we need to consider. Uh, you know, more work, I think, needs to be done in a prospective manner because, of course, this was a retrospective study and uh, several ongoing prospective studies should help us to answer more specifically what those mechanisms might be. Um, studies like the Marbles study and the Early study and the National Children's study and maybe the Norwegian study might help us as well. Thank you. Next we're going to take a call from somebody on the phone. Jane? This question is also for Dr. Hertz Picciotto and anybody else. Um, and it's from Caitlin Hagen from CNN. It appears from some of the research presented, including Dr. Pichotta's work, that there is more evidence that what's causing children to have autism is happening in utero. How much closer does this research being presented at IMFAR bring us to finding the causes of ASD? And doesn't this provide more evidence that the autism vaccine link is a much more unlikely cause of ASD, even if it is still very much believed to be the cause for many people? I'll, I'll go first, and then if my colleagues want to add to that. Um, you know, every study that's done and every little piece of evidence really adds to a larger body of science that uh, draws upon many different kinds of studies, and I tried to highlight that a little bit in the presentation, um, that there are epidemiologic studies, there are animal model studies, there are studies done in tissue cultures, there are um, autopsy studies, and each of these brings different kinds of evidence that can come together and converge on a better understanding of uh, the etiology of autism and ways in which we could intervene. Um, how much closer, you know, on what kind of a scale do we measure? We are really very much at the early stages of understanding autism etiology, and I will um, 
be quick to add that part of the reason for that are uh, problems in the scientific community that set us back for 20 years, um, going back to the 1960s when the prevailing paradigm was that it was uh, bad parenting styles that led to autism. We know that is absolutely not the case, but there is a legacy, and part of that legacy is that we are not as far along that curve that we, as we should be. With regard to the second question on does this uh, negate um, the vaccine theory, um, I think it actually has no relevance whatsoever to that question. And the reason for that is because autism is not a single cause disorder. It is a multifactorial disorder. And when I say multifactorial, I don't mean, well, this child, it must be that, and this other child here, it must be, you know, factor B and, and so forth. Um, I mean multifactorial within each child, that there are probably multiple factors. It might start out with two or three susceptibility genes that by themselves would not produce autism, but then something happens early on in gestation that adds to insult to the pre-existing you know, vulnerability, and then something else happens a little bit later in gestation, and maybe there are things that happen postnatally as well. I don't think we can preclude postnatal factors, um, but uh, I, you know, I think this really doesn't bear on, on the vaccine question. I think they're, they're really, um, you know, they're not incompatible and they're not, uh, they don't, you know, necessarily build on each other either. I'd just like to make a comment on that as well. Um, I, I think a lot of the data that are coming out at IMFAR will address this question, sometimes tangentially. Um, we have a, uh, there's lots of work that's going to be presented on uh, work related to what Dr. Korshena talked about, brain development and brain function. Um, we, from our lab, are presenting some data on Friday morning. Christine Nordahl is the first author. Uh, and we have confirmed what Dr. Korshena has been saying for a number of years, that there is this precocious brain growth uh, that is seen between birth and, and three years of age. But the interesting twist that we're presenting is that that precocious brain growth, at least in our cohort, uh, which is about 200 children that we analyzed, uh, is most prominently associated with children that have regressive form of autism. These, these are the kids that really sort of highlight the, issue, the vaccine issue because these are children that uh, have normal development to you know, 12 to 18 months and then lose social ability and, and lose language function and regress back into autism. But again, the interesting thing is that even though the precocious brain growth is most associated with these kids that have a, a regressive form of autism, when we look at head circumference, we see that the changes started around four to six months of life, exactly replicating what Dr. Korshane has been saying for a number of years and showed us this morning. So that despite the fact that the regression, the behavioral regression takes place at 18 months or 24 months, the brain changes actually started taking place at four to six months. So it, it actually cast a sort of, uh, again, a, a doubt on the, the idea that, uh, you know, a vaccine, the MMR vaccine, for example, that's taken at 12 to 18 months uh, would be actually the precipitating factor because things were starting much, much earlier than that. So I, I think what you'll hear from various, you know, studies presented at the meeting as well as the environmental studies is that, you know, the more biology we know, the more we can actually answer these kinds of questions and concerns that are raised by the families. Dr. Corshane. So, uh, in addition to each of those uh, points that were made, uh, we have a couple of papers uh, that are being presented that provide information from post-mortem studies of the frontal cortex in the autistic uh, young child. This is the part of the brain that grows too, uh, uh, too fast and too large, uh, and Dr. Amaral was just uh, alluding to that. And this is the part of the brain that has abnormal connectivity, which I just reported uh, this morning at really young ages. And what we found was genetic evidence that in the, uh, at the end of the, we found genetic evidence of dysregulation of functions governing the number of cells in uh, the autistic brain. Genetic evidence of dysregulation of functions that govern the migration of cells from where they're born to where they reside in the cerebral cortex. Genetic evidence of dysregulation of the patterning of the brain, the normal left-right asymmetry of the brain. All of those functions are second trimester functions. 
the genetic evidence we found points strongly to dysregulation of functions that are important for constructing the cerebral cortex in autism, especially our evidence comes from frontal cortex, um, points strongly to dysregulation of functions that govern that in the second trimester. And then on Friday morning, I'm going to be mentioning preliminary evidence that shows that in frontal cortex, there is almost a two-fold increase in the total number of brain cells. And that's in two-year-olds and three-year-olds with autism. So that sort of evidence strongly points to, as uh, Dr. Amaral was saying, to very early events that are driving the failure of the normal organization of the brain. And then the last point I wanted to make is that if there's too many neurons that are generated because there's genetic failure to regulate the number of neurons, then naturally you must have too many axons, too many fibers, too many connections. And what I just reported this morning was evidence of possibly an acceleration of the total number of axons that are present early on. So rather than underconnectivity early on, you have overconnectivity. And all these things are being driven by events that are prenatal. And I also want to hold out that, yes, indeed, our evidence is all genetic. That doesn't mean that there's not environmental uh, uh, factors that may also be playing out in the first and second trimester. Uh, so speaking to the vaccines postnatal, there's uh, none of the evidence that we have uh, points to that. Our evidence points mostly to events that are prenatal, uh, genetic and possibly other factors as, uh, uh, as you pointed out too. Thank you, I think we have another question from the phone. Two questions. All right, this is from Erica Check Hayden, senior reporter from Nature, and it's for Dr. Corshane. And it's a three-part question. I'll read it in its entirety. If you need me to go back and repeat the questions, I'd be happy to. Please answer in the form of a question. <laughs> <laughs> For $100, what is the hypothesis of how neuron overgrowth leads to autism? Secondly, what other data is available to corroborate the hypothesis? And lastly, the authors propose to use this as a biomarker what would be the value of using these FA value as a biomarker when their significance in autism pathology is not really known? Right. I, we haven't proposed that uh, FA could be used as a biomarker, so I can deal with the third one pretty quickly. Uh, maybe one day it will be, but I think it would be premature to propose it as a, a biomarker. Uh, our finding is an indicator of the underlying neural pathology, uh, particularly anatomic defects that may instigate uh, the first signs and symptoms of autism. <clears throat> As to the other parts of the question, there is no evidence that's been published that speaks one way or the other to the underlying cause of early brain overgrowth. So head circumference, there's now at least 10 independent laboratories that have verified the finding of early brain overgrowth based on head circumference. There's a number of groups, uh, Dr. Amaral's group, Joe Piven's group, uh, Jerry Dawson's group, as well as ours that have found MRI evidence of early brain overgrowth. So th there's now quite a bit of evidence on that point. But strikingly, no one has been able to demonstrate, prove through experimental uh, methodologies what the neural underpinnings uh, are for that. And the reason is that it's, um, there's, it, there, there, it's been very difficult to the community, the autism community has had a bit, a bit of a difficult time accepting the importance and the central role of neuropathology studies of uh, autism at the youngest ages. To put it succinctly, there is no developmental neuropathology of autism. There are virtually, with the exception of one or two from our laboratory, uh, my former student, John Morgan, who is now with uh, David Amaral, uh, there's just one or two uh, age change studies of the neuropathology of autism, examining how the brain changes from early ages on through adolescence and adulthood. In the absence of firm knowledge of the underlying cellular, molecular, and in the brain genetic information, this disorder will remain a bit of a mystery for a long time. In the absence of that sort of information, 
It's not going to be possible to develop uh, animal models or cellular IPS-based models that have any good fidelity because they won't have targets. We won't know what the underlying biology is. If a person supposes there's a gene involved in autism and they construct an animal model and the animal doesn't uh, explore normally or doesn't show normal social behavior, what does that show? Well, we know there are a lot of ways of producing those sorts of abnormalities. There's, in the absence of anatomic or cellular information or molecular information from the actual autistic brain, we won't know if that genetic model is modeling any aspect of the underlying biology. That said, what I, what I just mentioned last time I, I, I spoke here, we have bits of evidence that suggests that it's due, that the overgrowth is due to an excess number of neurons. There is no known uh, postnatal method in the human for generating a gigantic excess of neuron numbers. And that suggests that it's a prenatal event. How that generates, how that leads to autism, excess neurons, excess axons. If you had a two-fold increase in the number of neurons, you could have as much as a four-fold increase in axons. So when the, ch when the normal child begins life, the normal child is beginning life with roughly the number of neurons it needs to operate with, and roughly the potential to now start creating connections based on experience and learning. In autism, they're beginning in life with perhaps as many as 50% or 100% more neurons. Their job is to get the, so the autistic uh, brain and child is faced with the task of getting rid of the excess neurons. Removal and remodeling becomes the task for the next two or three decades in order to pare down the total number of neurons and the total number of axons and connections to a level that's more appropriate for normal function. And that's a, that's a tough job. And that's what we think is going on. But in order to know that that's true, which is a model, and I speak about it on Friday, in order to know whether that's true, we need much more bio, you know, real hardcore biology research uh, in the field of autism. We have too few people doing the kind of work that David's lab on uh, postmortem work does, that our lab does, and about, what, a half a dozen or a dozen other labs. We need several dozen labs, and we need more intense work on this. Biological changes are increasing over time and may be related to the growing prevalence of autism. And if yes, could you please speculate about what environmental or other factors could be contributing to why these fiber bundles are more likely to grow abnormally now versus in past years? We, th there is no evidence about what the condition of the autistic brain was in a generation ago or two generations ago. So it's a, a kind of a tough question to, to address. And the reason we don't know is because the access to um, the, the necessary biological specimens is, is simply not there. You know, one could study postmortem cases of a four-year-old or a 70-year-old with autism and see what the brain looks like. But what we and others are beginning to show is that autism is a complex disorder that is a life that, that spans the life. Neuropathology changes continuously throughout this disorder. The pathology that, you can, that would be identified, whether it's gene expression pathology in a 20-year-old with autism or a 40-year-old or a 6-year-old, is not going to look like the gene expression abnormalities of a 2- or 3-year-old. We know that from our evidence. The cellular basis is not going to be the same. Some of the really strong, the very first stereology study ever done on autism was done by Dr. David Amaral and Cindy Schumann, and they found uh, reduced numbers of neurons in the amygdala in 10-year-olds to 44-year-olds. And that, was, that's, that still stands as one of the best studies done on the postmortem brain using quantitative methodology. What's striking about that is their group, our group, uh, Dr. Dawson's group, uh, Dr. Joe Piven's group, we've all of us found that the amygdala is not smaller at the beginning. In two to four year olds, the amygdala is bigger. So how do you get a bigger amygdala with fewer neurons? Well, the reason there are fewer neurons in the 10 to 44 year old range is because the brain is going, undergoing a process of removal. 
So studies of the older brain aren't going to tell us what's going on in the youngest brain. So to answer Shirley's question succinctly, there isn't evidence to tell us whether there are differences in uh, the underlying biology of autism today as compared to uh, 20 or 40 or 60 years ago. I want to add something about the paper that we're presenting on Friday regarding the amygdala volume in uh, not very young kids, but in older kids. And we didn't find, it's a longitudinal study, and we didn't find any difference in the amygdala size between kids with autism and uh, controls. So, but this is an older group compared to the group that's been uh, studied earlier, like early on. And, and so that, that's really a wonderful uh, and important finding because it says that you have this this dual time course of early overgrowth and then arrest of growth. And there's a good number of studies that show at later ages there's either reduction or equal size. And at early ages, there's an enlarged size. So the brain is trying to correct itself. And the adult autistic brain is different. And actually, you know, a take home message here should be not only that it's important to really study the young autistic brain to find out what the underlying causes are that begin the disorder, but it's extremely important to, under, to understand the older autistic brain because there's an ongoing change, and that ongoing change must have significant impact on their ability to function. And studies necessary to help improve the lives, the function, the behavior, and the clinical course of, of the adolescent and, the a, uh, and young adult with autism really need to be focused on what's different, how can we help them, they're undergoing change. They're try their brains are trying to remodel to improve themselves. How can we how can we benefit them? And I think that's an understudied area. I'll just add something with regard to this question about changes over time and what you know. I, I clearly we don't know what environmental factors might contribute to the early brain overgrowth at this point in time. Um, I think it's a misconception that everything that's causal in relation to autism has to be has to have increased over the last few decades. Um, the reason that that's not true, uh, and is that we know that part of the increase has been due to better diagnosis, more complete ascertainment, some changes in the way. Uh, the definitions, uh, the actual definitions used for diagnosing autism. So we know that there were undiagnosed cases uh, 20 and 30 years ago, and clearly those cases, as, you know, there's a, there's a baseline rate there um, that was caused by something all along, and some of those causes are probably also operating today. Uh, and you know, a, a, an example, and, and you know, one I don't know that we can talk about specific mechanisms here, but <clears throat> we published data suggesting that air pollution uh, based, based on uh, traffic uh, density, um, we looked at homes, uh, children born closer, whose, whose mothers live closer to freeways versus further from freeways, and we find that the ones who live closer to freeways um, were at higher risk of, of de delivering children who had autism. So there are underlying causes um, that have not increased over, probably not increased, and some of them have may even have decreased over time, but may contribute to autism. Okay, we're just going to go for our last question out in the audience. If you could, I'm sorry, if you just come to the microphone so the people on the phone can hear your question. Deborah Rudisell, I'm news editor at the Simons Foundation. Um, and building on, on that comment, um, I'm just kind of curious what all of you think of the extraordinarily high prevalence rate that was just reported in South Korea, and um, if a, a methodology like that, a broad-scale population study, were conducted in the United States, fanning out into the community, do you think we'd also find um, a much higher rate than we, than we have right now? Thanks. Well, I read that paper carefully, and I think there were missing details that uh, did not permit me to really evaluate the methodology, um, questions about their uh, disabilities um, registry and, and uh, whether, whether they had actually checked to see that all of the cases came from the exact same target population as, as the population they used as their denominator. So, But the data just weren't there in the paper to really evaluate that. So I, I think at this point, we don't know.
Okay. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists um, very much for being here and sharing their studies with us. Thank you uh, to everybody here also for participating. We appreciate your coverage of the meeting. Um, all of the researchers, uh, not only here, but the researchers in the conference can be made available to you for further questions through either Allison, Jane, or myself, and we will be um, available in the press room, which is Molly A, around the other side of this floor. You can contact us there, and our phone numbers are also on the press release. So thank you all very much, and enjoy the conference. Yeah, yeah, I've got the process, that's what I was, I'm sorry to finish.